Ron Atkinson is a legend in the world of football. After seven years away from club management, he's back in a new role as a football troubleshooter. Four major trophies may prove there's more to him than champagne and suntans, but now Sky One has issued him with his biggest challenge yet. Does Big Ron still have what it takes to guide lower league clubs to success? We've sent him to second division Peterborough United to find out. Coming up on Big Ron Manager, tempers flare as results don't go Peterborough's way. I'm fucking time. I'm time, you fuckers. There's a fraught hunt for a new striker. That's what management's about, kid. You've got to make a decision. And Ron tackles the club's financial mess. I'm running out of money, I'm running out of time, I'm running out of ideas. I'm fucked, mate. Big Ron has now spent two weeks at Peterborough. One of his first tasks as troubleshooter has been to assess the progress of novice manager Steve Bleasdale. Strengths are passion, enthusiasm, good training ideas. I think he's got to learn something to make valid points. Because we want lads here to run their bollocks off. He actually makes 400 suggestions in a second. The players, they'll be going like, I can't take it all on board. Steve has been trying to find his feet since recently landing the new managerial role. But it hasn't been easy. Especially as the players know him as Bleo, their coach and confidant, not some hard-nosed boss man. Put the same effort in as me or fuck off. And it's been difficult with the transition from a coach. I've been Bleo for six or seven months. I've had to try and get the players on my side, you know, get a little bit of respect for you. Ron's first move to help Steve was in re-establishing an unwritten rule of football etiquette. Every football club I've ever been involved with, there's one guy in charge, that's the boss, the gaffer. And for my money, that's how he should be referred to. But it was becoming clear to this wise old owl that the problems went way beyond job titles. For some reason, you youngsters have got a lot to say to me, and let me tell you now, I'm the manager here, right? And whatever time I tell you to train, you train. To get to the root of this power struggle, Ron needed unprecedented access to the pressure cooker of the match day dressing room. But when he asked for it, things started to kick off. I don't want to come into the dressing room under them circumstances. No. If there's antagonism from you, I don't want to be in there. There will be antagonism. No, there will, Steve. No, there will, Steve. Great, Steve, there awesome. will be antagonism. Eventually, the issue was resolved amicably, and Steve agreed to give Ron a trial run of two games. As a new week dawns on Ron's Peterborough mission, our troubleshooter is in philosophical mood. Knowing football management as well as he does, it's no surprise to him that his arrival has ruffled a few feathers. I don't give myself, particularly in the role that um, I've got, you're not going to uh, please everybody all the time. But um, I think anything I endeavour or attempt to, to do or say will be done with the best possible intentions uh, for the good of, well, for the good of the club and for the good of the people involved in it. Come start, They've got a good run going, they're on fire, there's a good spirit, and they've got fixtures that, whilst you can't guarantee anything, a lot of the fixtures are what I call winnable. None more so than Peterborough's next game, at bottom of the table, Torquay. Going into the fixture, the Porsche are comfortably placed at sixth in Division Two, and even have an outside chance of automatic promotion. Though Steve feels he's done a typically thorough job preparing his team for the game, a recent changing room incident threatens to spoil the mood. Experienced central defender Mark Arbour has just found out the FA had to charge him for tampering with a urine sample during a routine drugs test. It was uh, one of the player samples on a bath in the shower room and I happened to pick it up and move it, um, which regularly say that it's, uh, you're not allowed to do it. 
but at the end of the day there was no intent to tamper with it. It's just a case of moving an object that was in my way. Hopefully it'll be a slap on the wrist and I'll get on with my football. On their way to Torquay, Steve has organised a final training session at non-league Tiverton Town. Left foot, right foot! Five minutes, get ready! Play! One, two, yes, touch! Gain it, join, you go! After putting the boys through their paces, he's particularly mindful that complacency could be the posher's greatest enemy. That's Lee Addison's one. Come in, quickly! Tomorrow, let me tell you, treat this game as if it's a fucking bottom of the league game and you will go under. It is an attitude game. You've got to get it right. You've got to be clued in here because we need them three points. We've got to be switched on. We've got to be lively. We've got to be at the races and you turf them over. If you don't, you'll go under tomorrow. OK, any questions at all? Let's go. With Bleasdale's words of warning hanging in the air, it's on to Torquay but a quiet night on the English Riviera. Match day, and it seems the sea air has put the boys in high spirits. Although it's no laughing matter for one of their party, Mark Arbor's belly aches over bodily functions continue. This time he's suffering a nasty bout of gastroenteritis. It's got gastro flu. My missus and kids had it, so as you know, I've caught it from there. Shed shits and vomiting all night. So. But just as all Bleo's preparations seem to be disappearing down the pan, Big Ron rides into town. Eddie, what's the, what's the news? What's up? With, how's this at the big centre off, Mark? Yeah, he's yeah. been to the toilet four or five times and he feels a bit sick and the physio always gives him some tablets. Uh, he's eating for the first time. And what's, what's the rest of the, what's the rest of the team? The rest of the camp's good. Yeah, do you do you a chat? Or? I've had a lot of chats with them mm -hmm. um, and I've caught a two and uh, obviously you'll come in the room. I'll get them going just before we, we kick off, you know. Okay. And, Let's get them motivated and right. ready for the game. All right. Don't get you set up again. All the best kids. See you in there. Okay. No grab. As the players arrive at Torquay's tiny seaside ground, Mark Arbour finally confirms his place in the starting lineup. As for Ron, newly agreed access to the dressing room means he can now get the measure of Steve's pre-match team talks. I always like to keep my team talks uh, pr pretty positive, short and sharp, make it clear to the players what, what you expect from them. Try not to leave them confused, because um, that is a danger sometimes of over-talking, because uh, my experience of footballers, and rightly so to a certain extent, you can, uh, if you talk too long with them, their attention span ain't the greatest. Listen up, OK, everyone? Just give me 10 minutes. First of all, my team, this dressing room, brimming with confidence, full of great spirit, adaptable, flexible. I know on our day, we can kill teams. We can go three or four nil up. And at the minute for me, you are just stuck in fourth gear. I'm waiting for that fifth gear. I'm telling you the about us. And the word I'm looking for before the finish is sloppy mode. We do not do it today. Attitude, 100%. I know we can do it. I've got a good feeling today. Have you got the same belief? Yeah. 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 Two right. Go Let's boys. go, boys. boys. The team's body language isn't convincing. And sure enough, as soon as the match starts, Leo's worst fears become reality. Despite repeated warnings not to underestimate lowly Torquay, his players are being completely outmaneuvered. Not at the races here. Hey, not at the races at all. Johnny, get him switched on! Do it! 
Even Ron is moved to step in. And he makes his way to the dugout to try and influence proceedings. You know when the ball drops in mid it's kind of spin and run yeah. two or three times, and then the next time, check out and have it. I tell you, if he gets his act together, he'll win this two or three. Two or three. We're fucking shite today, you know. We're absolutely shite today. With Posh unable to rouse themselves, it's no huge surprise when Torquay claim the only goal of the game. It's Martin Phillips looks for Tony Beddo. Beddo's volley! Fantastic finish! Super goal for Torquay! Fuck's sake! these games bottom of the leagues fuck's sake the player's complete disregard for all his warnings is clearly gnawing at the manager finally Blio blows a gasket. They fucking wanted that game, and I said beware. I've never spent so fucking ten minutes before the game telling you how good you are. Perhaps it was me. Perhaps I need to tell you how fucking shit you are sometimes. It seemed forever to pass the ball. You've got to fucking do everything early. We flicked and farted all day. Sloppiness. No one give me nothing but attitude and sloppiness. That is what I'm saying. We weren't at the races, not at the races. Sloppiness, attitude, shit. The posh have been humiliated by the bottom team in their league. Time for the experts' verdict. And for Ron, the finger of blame clearly points in one direction. I'll tell you what, boss. I think the front people, by and large, were powder puff today. I really didn't. I don't think they give it you. Don't disagree with that, Ron, whatsoever. Sloppy mode was the word you came into the dressing room. I thought Crowey, who didn't score a goal, I thought he didn't play. One thing nobody can stop you doing on a football field, you know, is running. They can't stop you running. It's every time I see him, he's wanting the ball cheap. Yeah, yeah. And defenders, it's, it's easy to mark, yeah. you know. I'm afraid that if, if he continues like that, you're carrying him. Your spots are on, really, we've got to get someone in. And obviously, I know what's gone, gone wrong today. And um, see if we can get the two strikers in that's on my mind right now to get them in. That's what we're lacking. The defeat puts a huge dent in the club's promotion drive. All hopes of automatic promotion now a rapidly fading dream. Coming up, the chase for a new striker is far from straightforward. That's what management's about, kid. You've got to make a decision. And Ron gets some shocking financial headlines from his old pal, Barry. If Peterborough United go under, they repossess me houses. I finish with nothing. Nothing at all. Big Ron knew it might get tough when he took up our challenge to prove himself as a troubleshooter with struggling Peterborough United. But the job's already testing all his management skills. On the pitch, he's trying to help rookie boss Steve Bleasdale impose his authority. Too many people got too much to say here. Do what I fucking say or you're fucking dropped on Saturday. Off it. His pal, Chairman Barry Fry, is fighting simply to keep things afloat. He's calculated that missing out on promotion will cost the club around half a million pounds, which could just be the difference between survival and extinction. <laughs> to make things worse, many fans are running out of patience with Barry's wheeler-dealer ways. Fuck Barry Fry, fuck all of I mean, I speak to people all the time, and they say to me, I used to be a posh fan for years and years and years, followed them all the time, but I will not go while Fry's here. And, you know, that's 90% that's people out to me. But before Ron can help his old mucker, he needs to know quite how bad the posh's financial woes actually are. Cool, that sounds great. <laughs> yeah, that's right, mate. 
What's your total holding in the club? What percentage do you own? I, I own 100%. Okay. The, 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 the guy that sold me the club was very good. He warned me not to do it. He said I was mad. He said, you will not last till Christmas. I sense, since I've been here, there's been like, there's a certain segment with an anti-Barry situation, oh, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. Now, some of the things you've told me since, I, I, I just can't believe, you know, that you've actually done to maybe keep the club afloat. We got a 500 grand overdraft. We need some more money, so I have to cash in my pension early, get a lump sum under grand, put it in the club. I have borrowed the money, so I am legally bound. I've got a monthly repayment of a mortgage and of another loan for this and elsewhere where I've borrowed money to put into the club as well. Mm. You know, so I have got to pay that back. Mm. If I don't pay that back, they repossess my houses. If Peterborough United go under, they repossess my houses. I finish with nothing, nothing at all. Our last two gates have been a disastrous on Saturday. Mm. Ron, we took 27 grand towards a wage bill of 168 grand. It's a hell of a responsibility, you know. I can People imagine. People relying on you yeah. to pay them their monthly wages yeah. because they've got mortgages, or they've got rent, or they've got HP right. on the cars, or they've got right. kids. Y you are it's a all, nightmare. Let's look at a worst-case scenario. What would happen if you, right against your principles, decided to put the uh, club into administration? Uh, well. No, no, whether you could or whether you couldn't, and I'm not for a minute advocate, I'm just, I just want to give a side. Would that cost you? Oh, yeah, of course it would. They'd take the deeds of my house, mm. they'd sell the house to get the money back. The money that I've got in there as a, a, as a loan mm. would be, what? be nothing, wouldn't it? I ain't got no money, how can they pay me back? So somehow I've got to keep it going. And, I, and, and I'm, I'm running out of money, I'm running out of time, I'm running out of ideas. I'm fucked, mate. Barry's money worries are typical of lower league football. Over the past decade, a series of damaging events have left many clubs fighting for their lives. First, the Bosman ruling allowed out-of-contract players to negotiate their own terms, rather than clubs receiving a transfer fee. Shortly afterwards, ITV Digital's £315 million TV contract collapsed, leaving many clubs on unsustainable budgets. The final blow came last season, when world football's ruling body FIFA imposed the transfer window on the Football League. At a stroke, club's key revenue stream, player sales, was restricted to two short transfer periods each year. Ain't that a restraint of trade? Last year, I was in a situation I could not pay the wages one month. Mm. Picked the phone up, sold Leo Constantine to Torquay for 75 grand, mm. got me the wages. This year, I'm not allowed to do it. Can you believe that? I mean, if it weren't enough with the Bosman that killed football, and then with the ITV digital collapse, and then we have the transfer windows come in. I am absolutely amazed that there's still 92 clubs, as we know, still in existence. Barry's finances are a major long-term headache, but Ron's immediate priority is to check how preparations are going for the next game against Barnet. Um, nice Steve has acted on Ron's concerns about his work-shy strike force by stepping up training, but he's still having problems with his front men. Jimmy Quinn missing games with conjunctivitis and Danny Crow throwing an almighty strop. Danny Crow, be in my office for 1.30. Luckily, a partial solution is at hand. Although league clubs can't sign players outside the transfer window, they can bring them in on emergency loans. In Ron's absence, Birmingham have offered Peterborough their Finnish striker, Naz Kucci, and Barry, unable to resist a freebie, has snapped him up. What about the big leg from Birmingham? Barry's been after him, you've put a word in, he's gonna be an asset. Good control, I'm not sure about his abilities with regards to being a hustle and bustle player. He likes to get at his feet, he's asset to scoring goals, he's asset to in the box, he's good at set pieces. With the striker problem at least temporarily fixed, Ron tackles Steve on his dressing room delivery. Improve that, and it can only boost his credentials with the players. When you first want to talk here, I felt 
that it was, and it's an awkward, you know, you've got the cameras in there, I understand mm. that. I felt that you were trying to get too many points in mm. to maybe make sure you hadn't missed anything. Have your list of points that you're going to make. Yeah. Say, right, and go, boom, back four, great, but can you do that? Can you squeeze up? In midfield, can we pick up more second balls? I think you'll find, yeah, yeah. A, that will be a big help for you. Yeah. And I think it'll be a big help for the lads. Yeah. The day of the Barnes game. But before thoughts turn to football, there's a 67th birthday to celebrate. Very Happy good. birthday, dear Ron. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Well done, mate. Hey, if you're going to have any sort of a club, <laughs> that's got to be Chris Dell in future. Oh, right. Got it? You can. Right. Cheers, <laughs> my son. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers Let's hope mate. we're drinking after the match. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If Ron is to enjoy his glass of post-match bubbly, then there's a lot resting on new boy Naz, providing some extra punch up front. <laughs> <laughs> Next, Ron drops in on the pre-match team talk to check if Blio has taken on board his advice. Barnett, a team full of endeavour. They never stop running. They will today, I think, go 4-5-1. But I think they'll come for the point, mate, and they're going to frustrate us. Their strengths, they love the long diagonal ball and they'll break from wide areas and we'll counter that later. And the successful teams are the ones that do that. They're the ones that win the games, the ones that do the ugly bits right. You put it all together now, and you're laughing, I'm telling you. You deserve promotion. I know you're going to get it. Let's get changed and let's get on it, OK? <laughs> the verdict? A resounding thumbs up from Big Ron. By the way, I thought you did well there. That was bright. Yeah? Yeah, I nearly got my boots on. I thought the manager was bang up for it today with his uh, with his actual with his team talk. He, he did his more or less his tactics yesterday, um, but all it was today was a final reminder and a final wind up to the players. Yeah, today's match I think is a must-win game. It's certainly not a it's certainly not a game they can afford to lose. So Posh get things underway at London Road. But as the match kicks off, the team's new signing is rather less impressive. Come on, Nas! Kuti there robbed in possession by uh, King. Nas, Nas, when that ball comes, just be a little bit quicker to go press. Go on! All the way! In the box, who's in the box? Finish! Get down, Nas! Not the sharpest debut so far from Kuti. No aggression in the box. The ball forward here towards the run of uh, Kuchi. His first touch is very heavy. It's a goal for him. He's from Finland, isn't he? Oh, he's out. And to fuel Blio's ire, Barnes, who failed to win away in League Two since yeah. August 2005, yeah. opened the scoring. Hessen Tyler scores at the age of 40. It's his first goal for Barnett. And Barnett are ahead. Leo spends most of his half-time team talk trying to inject some passion into his classic thin. Naz, we need to be a little bit more aggressive in that box area there. Two or three balls have come in. You've got to be fucking aggressive and get in that box and press him, all right? You've got to just squeeze the play and press, all right? Yeah? Danny, keep working hard. Keep working. As the second half gets underway, Cucci's Dance. presence finally pays Dance. dividends. Or at least the added competition up front spurs on Danny Crow to produce a much improved performance. Gaines ball has found the run of Crow. Can he apply the finish? Danny Crow! Lovely, lovely goal! Come on, Come it's on. the start of the second half they simply craved. As for his new recruit, the manager's seen enough. <laughs> Side. It's the end of uh, Cucci's debut then, placed by Richard Logan. Barnett come forward once more, here's Barry Fuller, oh a first senior goal for Barry Fuller. With Naz gone, Peterborough and Barnett fight out a two-all draw. 
Long deep corner headed down here towards Richard Logan, who finds the equaliser. Logan levels. Though things could have been considerably worse had the visitors converted a last minute chance. They're going to win a fucking tackle. Oh, it's Liam Hatch. Liam Hatch there. What a chance to win the game. It finishes 2 2. Barry's reeling from Coochie's performance. The debut was a nightmare. He lacks aggression, this guy, and, and he, he looks to me as if he ain't played for ages. Um, you know, but who knows? You know, lots of people have had bad debuts. Not as bad as that one, mind you, but so Coogie come through it. In fact, the Barnet game proves to be Coochie's one and only Peterborough appearance, and he's allowed to return to Birmingham. So the posher striker problem remains, and it's back to the drawing board for Ron and Barry. Big important few days now, and it's deadline. Ron, uh, uh, as owner, I'll break the bank for, for two months. Don't matter what it costs. We've got to get the best centre forward available. I don't think we can go for people that's untried. I think we've got to get a uh, centre forward that knows where the back of the net is. And you look at his record, and he's done it. And I've told Steve that, and you know he's he, he's given me a few names. I don't know. You know we've talked about the lad from used to be at the Villa, Stephen Moore. Yeah, yeah. Would he interest you? Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, because he, he ain't got a proven goal record. He's a proper centre-forward, you know what I mean? He, he's got movement and uh, he's got uh, ability. As if you want, I'll, I've talked with the, with his owner. and I've talked No, no, if you, if you could get yeah. that, we need a, a final throw of the dice. Wouldn't argue with that. The draw with Barnett sees them slip a place to seventh and the chasing pack is snapping at their heels for that last playoff place. following week, as the players ease their aches and pains from Saturday's game, the hunt for a new striker is hotting up. While Ron is trying to persuade QPR Stefan Moore to join the club, Steve is scouring the country for alternatives. First he travels to Ipswich to check on some Chelsea reserves. Then it's a dash to Reading to assess their promising young strikers. But a combination of unsuitable players and club's reluctance to loan strikers means he's pinning his hopes on Ron hitting the jackpot. That'll be the pub of the season, that um, Stefan Moore's a great player. Whether he comes, we don't know, because there's loads of championship sides after him. But you never know, you know, if Ron can make his magic and get him in. But at the end of the day, I want a little bit of quality just for that little push for that last nine games. OK. All right. It's the day before the emergency loans window is due to close. And just when it seems the more transfers are done deal, Bleo does an amazing U-turn. Out of the blue, he wants to reject Ron's man for a cheaper non-league striker from Chessant. Lloyd Apara has been training with the club, and Steve reckons his raw, unproven talent could be the answer to Porsche's striker problems and playoff hopes. Fearing impending disaster, Ron makes an emergency visit to Barry's house. What's happening with the bringing new players in? I've spoke to um, uh, the manager of uh, Chesson about Lloyd Aparo, who came in yesterday and trained with us. Um, the gaffer fancies him strong, so I've done a deal with Chesson where we take him on loan till the end of the season. I had, I had a chat with uh, the lad Moore. So yeah. I mean, what's you better mark me card what, what you want to do about that. I mean, I personally, I've got to be honest with you, I personally think he's miles better than anything you've got. Yeah. You get it. Yeah, yeah. If you get hold of the guy and he'll come, I'll get hold of Steve and say, listen, I'm only signing one. Should we phone Stephen and ask him before oh. I go off to Chesson, what's he want to do? Oh. Steve Basil. Hello, Buzz. Yeah, I'm, I'm with Ron. He's, he's round and we're, we're having a natter. He's, he's obviously seen uh, Stephen Moore, like, like you said, and he, he wants to know where, where we're going to go with that. Yeah. It's going to be expensive, isn't he? And, you know, it's not his problem, mate. Um, can you... Um, it, see ya. 
Steve, it's Ron. In an ideal world, which one do you want? The lad you've, you've seen in three or four days training, the non-league player, or, um, I mean, quite frankly, I don't think there's any comparison, me. I think, I think, I think Stefan Moore would be a far better bet. But, you know, that's your decision. You've got to make... That's what management's about, kid. You've got to make a decision. Yeah, I'll tell you what, all right. I've been tricked about it, and we have to mix it up, you know what I'm yeah, saying? But I yeah. think Lloyd will give us something the other way. And, OK. Um, if I'm going to put my money on Stefan, I'm, I'm not sure about him, so if I'm not okay. sure, I'll probably leave him. OK, that's it. Well, all, all I want to know is so, I'm, so I don't have to pursue it any further. That's, that's basically... Uh, I think so, Ron. I think OK. So. See you later. Ta-ra, mate. He seems pretty sure... Has, it, has anybody in our camp ever seen Lloyd play in a match? No. That Now, I find that ever so strange. Sometimes for a non-league player that mm. not a lot of money, you, you, you have mm. a gamble, don't you? Yeah. I think we've gambled here. OK. So Ron's advice is flagrantly ignored. It's becoming ever clearer the club's cash crisis is really affecting events on the pitch. Despite Barry's defiant claims, he'd be pushing the financial boat out. Perhaps it was only a canoe he was pushing out. <laughs> no, I would think the owner would be happier with the wages he's going to have to pay. I mean, that's a club of obviously they've worked within their uh, financial constraints. If you'd have said to me personally, I would have thought Stefan Moore would have been quite a coup for the club. But, you know, that's, that's history now, and you go with what you got. Coming up, we see Ron leap into action to help raise funds for his old pal. That might be Arnold Palmer already ringing in there, because <laughs> Hello. And the team face another intense afternoon as they take on a rejuvenated Oxford team. When it's a battle, you fucking battle! Yes, you battle! You battle! Battle! <laughs> Tonight on Big Ron Manager, our elder statesman has risen to the challenge of his Peterborough mission. The strikers have been playing up. The team's been underperforming in the league. For fuck's sake! And Chairman Barry is broke. If Peterborough United go under, they repossess me houses. I finish with nothing. The club desperately needs a boost, both to its profile and its bank balance. When troubleshooting Ron next catches up with Peterborough's general manager, Joan Hill, he has it all figured out. Every club I've ever been has, has always been a golf table. It's a good money-making thing. It gives you an opportunity to do a good auction afterwards. I've always found it's, it's one of the easiest ways in a one-hit to make money and everybody enjoys it. Could you try and arrange with your wonderful contacts in the football fraternity some mega superstars to come on board? Then how fantastic for a company to buy a package with a celebrity. I'm pretty sure if I'd been in touch with some friends of mine, it should not be a problem. Um, that might be Arnold Palmer already ringing in. The <laughs> Ron calculates that at 500 pounds a team, his golf day could raise 10 grand. Add in an auction, and that total could more than double. In one hit, he could outstrip takings on a match day. Good morning, bonsoir. Come and tell you. To minimise costs, he calls in a favour with his property developer mate, Chris Davis. Well, normally what we do is if we're sponsoring a, a golf event, yeah. we provide golf balls, hats, yeah. um, polo shirts. Yeah. We bring a few celebrities down to yeah. make the event a bit special. Yeah. It'll be mm. a first in Peterborough. That's yeah. what I'm looking forward to. <laughs> <laughs> See you, Pops. My radio contact. The club's obviously going to need more than Ron's one-off fundraising events to survive in the future. In today's football climate, the best long-term strategy seems to be to invest in a youth programme. This can produce a steady stream of free football talent and allow clubs to cash in on their homegrown prodigies by selling them. Barry Fry recognises this and is trying to resurrect Posh's old academy. Ron decides to take a look. Clubs of this, this type, you know, that uh, obviously aren't going to be able to compete in the big money market and to a large extent have got to be able to go out and develop their own players. 
economics forced them to fold the youth system up a few years ago. And I think uh, it's good to see that Peterborough are going to be able to do this next year. They're starting to get the youth team back into the process and uh, it'll be a year or two before they see the value of it. And the important thing is somehow or other <laughs> for battle to keep the club afloat until such time. Ron makes the most of this training session with some sage words of advice on how to achieve this goal. People have got to be patient. I mean, you know, it's but they're telling you've got some very, very good sort of nine and ten year olds. Yeah, we've got some yeah. some excellent youngsters coming through and um, particularly at the younger age groups now. Um, we're looking very, very strong. I think we're developing now at the older age groups, but mm. now would be an ideal situation for, yeah. for maybe to, to get yourself on board and, and hopefully help us with, to try and find that extra little gem that we're looking for. Inspired to help unearth a shiny new gem for Peterborough, Ron organises a trials day for local kids. Over 100 boys turn up, hoping to make it through to a final team of 11. These are pitted against a Peterborough youth team at the club's London Road ground. So Ron can select a winner who will land the one remaining place in Posh's youth setup. Well, 19-year-old first team player Jamie Day is the last product of Posh's old youth policy. He's all too aware of the long journey that lies ahead. When I was younger, I had that extra bit of hunger. I remember how nervous I was in my very first game, so I feel for some of them because some are going to go away disappointed, but, you know, that's football. That happens sometimes. Next year, could, you know, it could work out. The trialists eventually gain a credible 3-1 defeat to Peterborough, and Ron has the unenviable task of picking a winner. Well, first of all, that's well done. That's as entertaining a game as I've seen on this ground all season, so it's good. Both teams good. Um, and I've got a very hard task, actually, because I've got to pick somebody out uh, to go into the School of Excellence. And it's hard, because I tell you what, a lot of you have done ever so well. In fact, you've all done ever so well. Little man, I'm going to pick you today. Congratulations. You're the one for today. OK, big hand for the lad. You enjoy it? Yeah. Okay. So, well done to Sean White. He's, um overwhelmed by his success. What does it mean to you? Good. <laughs> now it's time for Ron to return to his primary task, helping the first two. They're busy preparing for their forthcoming encounter against Oxford United. Just a week ago, Ron and Bleo went to Oxford on a scouting mission. There they found a club in turmoil. Fans protesting against their chairman and a team struggling at the wrong end of the table. But in just seven days, Oxford have achieved a remarkable turnaround. A consortium that includes former Oxford legend Jim Smith has taken ownership of the club and revamped the team. So what looked just days ago like an easy assignment has become a major test of their mettle. The Invisible Drives have been a big crowd, a big ground swell. Um, whereas a few weeks ago, a misplaced pass would be a groan. Now it won't be, so that all, that all adds to the mix. I, I say there's a big cake with a, with a load of icing on it, you know? And we don't want to give anyone a bit of that cake. And we want to take a little slice of it every Saturday. And once we get four or five of that slices of that cake, that's what it's about for me, you know? Then you can eat the whole of the cake. That's the playoff final. That's the way I look at it. If Steve is going to have his cake and eat it, his team will need to shrug off their poor form. Although they'll have to manage without their captain, Dean Holden, who's suspended. Tough tackling midfielder Paul Carden is handed the armband. While new signing Lloyd Apara has to settle for a place on the bench. The manager there. Before the match kicks off, Ron grabs an opportunity to wish his old pal Jim Smith not too much luck. In the dressing room, Steve delivers his final pep talk, hoping his team will start responding to his leadership. OK, everyone, tune in and look at me. I have a team here that are fit. I have a team here that are strong. 
I have a team here that have got belief so much that I know we can do this today. I know we can do it. But when you cross them white lines now, you're together. Togetherness is the key. All the best. Once the match gets underway, all Posh's old frailties against bottom of the table opponents re-emerge. The teamwork Steve had appealed for is non-existent, and the players appear to have no stomach for the battle ahead. Pass it! Pass it! The notable exception is goalkeeper Mark Tyler. He's staging a heroic one-man stand in the face of an Oxford onslaught. Jay Smith again, Tyler to the rescue. Oh, fucking save that was. Really well hit. Great save. And his passion must score, but he hasn't scored. Mark Tyler in the way again. Looking at the moment, I think it's just inevitable. Oxford will score. They can't, they can't keep expecting the goalkeeper to make wonder saves. Deep cross here, up on its way. Man comes to Sham and Toya. And Toya away from Newton. And Toya scores on his debut. Sham and Toya. Oxford ahead. In a last ditch attempt to salvage the match, Leo sends on his new boy, Lloyd Opara. But his best efforts are not quite good enough. Travel! He's Opara. Good surge down this near side. Opara's ball across goal. And Danny Crow couldn't quite connect. At the final whistle, it seems yet another poor result has stemmed from yet another gutless performance. They never got out the blocks. They got a first-class surface to play on. Play with little or no tempo. It's going to need a lot of motivation and a lot of uh, character now. They're going to achieve what they want to achieve. The reason we've lost out is because they've given more effort than what we have. Now, that is a disgrace. There's no excuse for that. If I play a team and they beat us and they're better than us, fair enough, you hold your hands up, beaten by a better side. But when you beat them by sheer effort, it pisses you off big time. If they displayed an abject lack of fight on the pitch, the boys more than make up for this off it. Calm down. Calm down. Calm down. Calm down. Fucking fannying. I've never known a fucking team of fanniers in all my fucking life. We have to dog to win this league and to get the playoffs. You have to dog it out. I'm gonna go root fucking one, three, four, fucking three. You don't win fuck all in this league for passing the fucking ball. Yes, I like to pass. It's frustrating. Get it, fucking give it. Get it, turn him. Fucking simple. When it's right to play, you pass it. When it's a battle, you fucking battle. Yeah. Yes, you battle. Fair enough. You battle, Fair enough. battle. To make matters even worse, embattled Blio then has to face his recurring bugbear, player descent. Joe Bolton, they spend, they spend, they spend, they spend, they spend a full day on set pieces. No one's having a go at you. You said it. Why say it then? If it was Sam Allardyce, you wouldn't fucking say it. I'm fucking sick of it. Always got fucking something to say. Someone, someone here has always got something to say. I'm together. I'm for you. I know it does. It means something to me. Look at me. Then great. I'll fucking voice my opinions. I'm the fucking manager. 
Next week, Ron truly has his work cut out as the fallout from the Oxford Paratechnics threatens to capsize Potter's season. Okay, now. We've lost our way. Fucking blind man can see it, chaps. You got in a good position and have thrown it away. You are losers. You don't know what I do in the afternoons. Sure, you want just have a little bit of respect for me, son? I've got a wife and fucking kids to look after. And then cunts will get you the sack, Andy. I'm glad I'm not a manager. Will the club spiral into complete anarchy? If I have to have a fucking fight here, I'll fucking have one this morning. Or can Ron draw on all his 50 years of experience and steer them back to the promised land of promotion? I think it needs a few heads banging together. Absolutely magnificent. He's far more satisfying to see a goal scored against United than against anyone else. Catch the top 50 goals ever scored against the Red Devils over on Sky 2 now, while well, next here on Sky 1. Have a nice day, kids. I want to bite you. Oh! It's Weeds.